sustain business growth across generation to inspire, influence, and connect family businesses and professionals. So the concept of family business has evolved, has been studied, um, has been sparked. Good afternoon once again and congratulations to our uh, set of officers who were elected via our virtual election. At this point, allow me to introduce a person who is uh, really into helping families manage their wealth as well as also uh, plan for continuity and of course sustainability of wealth and the business of uh, families as well as uh, continuity of wealth management. Uh, he is the founder and president, of course, the chief executive officer of Premier Family Business Consultants Incorporated. He has served already more than 70 families in business to date, registered financial consultancy course of the International Association of Registered Financial Consultancy that is based in Ohio, USA, a graduate of Essentials of Management Development uh, that's uh, Gamma and the Principles of Leading by Example and Excellence in USA way back in 2002. He received his certification for the Guided Discovery course at the Heritage USA uh, last 2011. Certified Family Wealth Advisor of the Family Firm Institute. Uh, this is a leading family business resource center in the world in 2013. And also he got an advanced certificate in Family Wealth Advising in 2018. He's one of the pioneer graduates of the Advanced Management Program Southeast Asian Business Studies of the UANP and partnership with the IESE School of Business in Spain, 2013. He completed his executive education and mergers and acquisitions program in Stanford University graduate of business in 2019. I remember one time when uh, our speaker uh, was uh, one of those resource in uh, uh, just like of this uh, in the previous years here in Kagian. Uh, he, he showed and he shared uh, that on his way back, uh, there was a, a misschedule of the plane and uh, he was able to show us that he was the only passenger or, or only two of them uh, passengers in the, in the plane. So uh, uh, he had been helping so many families as well. And uh, we know that he is blessed also uh, with his talent, skills and his resources to help us. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome an RFC and ACFWA, Mr. Jonathan John Ramos. Magandang hapon, sir. Good afternoon. Maayong hapon din na. Well, thank you very much, Sir Clef Clifford Roa, for the warm and exciting introduction. It was indeed a very long memory to go back. Uh, and um, it was true that um, uh, we were like uh, left um, in the plane going to Cagayan de Oro at the time, but uh, the airline company was so uh, generous enough to bring us from Cebu to Cagayan de Oro with only two passengers, me and my COO at that time. Good afternoon, Chairman of the Board, um, Jaime Pagio, President Ruben, um, Sir Efren Oy, uh, Mr. Senio Sebastian III, good afternoon all of you, and congratulations to all the newly elected officers and uh, of Oro Chamber. Uh, my fellow entrepreneurs, professionals, and most especially to our dearest family business members, executives, officers, and members of Oro Chamber of Commerce. Maayong hapon, karinyong tanan. How are you? Uh, on my end, I think I need to fix my camera quickly. Um, I'm not sure if, um, there you go, it's much more clearer. I can see familiar names and friends in the virtual room this afternoon. Uh, well, the truth is, it is my privilege to speak with you this afternoon, not only because the topic at hand is very relevant and one of my, my core expertise, but I believe the topic is essential and close to each of your hearts, of our hearts. Oftentimes, we look for change in a family business setting and we set our goal to be able to perpetuate or build the legacy of our business and create a sustainable progress. And so this is the topic at hand, but I titled it as 
managing change in a pandemic-induced environment, the family business perpetuation. But before I start, may I quickly share my profile with fervent hope that I can share where I'm coming from and provide you context of my presentation so that it can add clarity and excitement. Is that okay? Can you give me a thumbs up? Yeah, thank you. I come from a family in business operating retail and you know, in a public market environment. I survived two closures of my own family businesses. Interestingly, this experience catapulted me to decide to go back to school and complete my college education, although in 10 years, but never too late anyway to be, to be a learned individual. Don't you think so? Well, after completing college in one of, my local, in one of the local universities here in Cebu City, I desired to explore more opportunities and pursued international education. Uh, just like uh, what has already been shared, I completed a mergers and acquisition um, executive program in Stanford Business Schools and also uh, an advanced management program in ESA Business School in Spain. And I also completed a basic and advanced certificate in Family Wealth Advising and Family Firm Institute USA. As a result, I got connected globally and became a member of the board of directors, the first Filipino to join the board of directors of a nonprofit global research and development of a family business consulting association, a family firm institute in the USA. That was really, you know, uh, that's who I was and I am today. How about you? Can you share to me your family business? How, how long have you been in the business? I mean, what factors in the pandemic positively or negatively affected you and why? Can I, you know, um, can I see some of those answers in your chat box? Able to engage yourself. But anyway, whatever situations you're in and expectations you have uh, at present, I absolutely and undoubtedly want you to be successful. And I want you to also achieve your goals, especially this afternoon. And I hope that you will leave this meeting happy and inspired. But here's my limitation. I can only deliver, or but I can't deliver my talk to satisfy and meet your expectations without your help. So I will need your focus and collaboration by writing your questions and thoughts in the chat box and by sharing your emo emoticons if needed. I will certainly appreciate all your thoughts and your questions, even at the middle of my presentation. It means that you, know, uh, you are engaged and I am also inspired with your engagement. Is that okay? My proposal is for you to be part of the goal you want to achieve in this talk. Is that okay? All right, let's get on. Can, can you give me a, a sample, uh, a press of your emoticons? All right, that's good, thank you. Well, the global health crisis we are in today has taken its tool on the economy and continues to cast its shadow, the fear over us, especially to our personal, family, and business lives. Many of us has been triggered to either letter A, take more risks, or letter B, dump risks. Some are holding back their development plans, while others are aggressively investing and pursuing growth plans. How about you? Are you in the A group, the aggressive? Or are you in the B group, the conservative? A or B, I would like to make a statement that instead of letting this crisis or fears deter us May this push us to act swiftly to, take, to think of the best means to protect and achieve our dreams. And this might probably be what most of you are doing already with the pandemic, which triggered you to do well. With the pandemic, it allows you to do a lot of insighting, foresighting, planning, seeking out relevant data, and making tough decisions. Inciting is, basic, is basically the process of understanding what consumers need or want. It is getting to the heart of people's thoughts, motivations, and behaviors to inspire business opportunities. 
while foresighting is a process to understand and see what will or might happen in the future. So, both in sighting for and foresighting, guess what? Requires planning and research. While it requires planning and research, it does require change and the ability to manage change. What makes it more interesting and maybe difficult for some is that it involves multiple characteristics, styles, and mindsets of people when taking change and managing change. Thus, the need to collaborate, communicate, and learn. Guess what? Here we are, the in now. After one year and eight months of battling COVID, and of course, hurdling whatever challenges it throws our way, we have lost some and gained some, but the very fabric of the crisis we are facing right now has greatly affected our families who own businesses from startup growth to expansion and mature stages of the business. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, we are facing the same battle but in different degrees. But my question here is that, will your family last? Or will your business last? Is your family business built to last? How can we manage a pandemic-induced change towards perpetuating our family business? I'm sure many of you have been looking forward to these you know, um, engagements to this talk and hear what I have to say about the topic. Or you may have set your expectations on what you will learn today. And some are looking for inspirations or in fact validation or affirmations of what they have already done well. That's good. But some are still in limbo of what they need to do. And others may have done some changes but are not getting any results yet. Why am I sharing you this? Primarily because I'm selling or advocating change. Well, the results we want to see primarily start from each one of us and you as individuals. Do you agree? Do you agree? Change is imminent and we'll get the results we want if we adopt and try something we haven't done before with zeal and competence. You have heard of the old family business stories that the first generation creates it or builds it. The second generation makes it a success or grows it. And the third generation squanders it. You all are very familiar with that story. In fact, it is an adage. But we want to change that and make the third generation become the stewards. But this itself needs an amount of change to shift. Do you agree? Now, how often are you to change? How open do you define how fast you can learn? Or how do you apply quickly the learning, such as what you're going to learn maybe today to reap results, especially at this time of our economy? Well, ladies and gentlemen, the challenge here is that I want you to change. Can you say this? I want, can we say it? I want the change in me and I want to begin now. Can we do that? I want the change in me and I want to begin now. Great. You know, what's so difficult in doing this kind of speaking engagement virtually is that you don't usually hear responses from your you know, audience, but of course, if you be kind enough to somehow use your chat box to somehow articulate or to write in, in you know, um, your, your uh, responses, um, can you do that? I want the change in me and I want to begin now. I want the change in me and I want to begin now. Hello, are you with me? Are you engaged? Thank you. 
Right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, change can scare a lot of people. But in today's workplace, managing change is what keeps people relevant. Managing change is what keeps people relevant. Being held accountable for managing change and making things better in your work is the new normal. And knowing how to innovate and manage change is in fact now a requirement. Requirement that should be placed in one's job descriptions and permanence and performance review. Being responsible to generate results is one thing. Knowing how to make the results more sustainable, profitable, and multifaceted is another thing. Do you agree? Ladies and gentlemen, the new workplace requires everyone to lead and or coordinate change in some shape or form. But very few have been formally trained to assure that it is effectively implemented. And this is the opportunity that everyone must learn to embrace. Let me share to you one of my favorite author, John Cutter, a Forbes magazine contributor, author and writer on his research. And he wrote something about change management versus change leadership. Are you interested? You know, here's another question. What's the difference? Here is what he discovered. He defines change management as a set of basic tools or structures intended to keep any change effort under control and to create, of course, timely results. This is very essential in every business, more so to family owned and controlled and managed businesses. Why? Because it is your job to always influence a more organized and professional way of managing performance in the change process of, you know, family members who are working for the business or executives or professionals who are working for you. Correct? But change management by itself is impossible to succeed without change leadership. So change leadership must be planned and well thought of as well. The leadership you had that brought you into the success may not necessarily the same leadership skills that will bring you more success tomorrow. And in the same paper, Cutter defines change leadership as the engine on the whole change process. Again, the engine on the whole change process and making it go faster, faster, smarter, and more efficiently. And this is what it's all about today. It's no longer about how much money do you have or who has the biggest money, who has the most money today that will win. This is, now, this is not the environment of saying that cash is the king, but speed is the king. While I concur with how Mr. Cutter has defined the differences, and that in theory they represent two mutually exclusive roles, they both are actually dependent upon one common denominator. You know what it is? The ability to effectively sell change. Sell change. I think if there are a lot of things that have changed because of the pandemic, you know, our behaviors, our preferences, our abilities, our capabilities, our capacities, everything has changed except this one the importance of selling change. It's still very relevant. Do you agree? Well, for most people, they would rather hide from change and rub, rather than embrace it. They view change as something that will impair them rather than enable them, or especially of the, unfor of the unseen opportunities. What most people fail to realize is that change is one of the most powerful professional development tools available to them. Can I tell you something, you know, uh, from my own professional experience? Well, 
I learned about how to sell when I was really young. I come from a family business selling rice, corn, grits, vegetables in a public market here in you know, Cebu City. So selling is actually part of my system. But what I've realized is that you know, the ability for me to sell is not actually enough when you actually want the selling to be sustainable. What I mean about sustainability of selling is about infusing the capability to manage and lead change early in my career. Whether it was, you know, a uh, program or a, a uh, you know, uh, a professionaliza uh, professionalizing, uh, you know, activities that I've introduced to my family business or you know, trying to put in processes and putting in good governance structure of our family business, although I failed. But I think what is interesting there is that change was a common practice. Do you agree? I did introduce change at that time, but I failed. I did, you know, try to influence people to change, but I did not, you know, succeed. You know why? Because change takes time, but change also has to be reflected in the organization where you are able to get people, get leaders to also change with you. Change, as it impacts the entire organization, its people, brands, the entire supply chain, the processes and procedures, matters. And if your organization is undergoing any type of change management, such as transition from founder to, ge to second generation leader, or from legacy business process, you know, the mga inato na mga processes, to a more professionalized corporate transformation process, what's important is embrace it. Learn from the journey. Don't surrender. Be humble and hungry to learn fast because change makes you stronger and any adversity that goes with it makes you wiser. So embrace it. The next tool that all of us must have and do well in planning is actually inciting and foresighting the strategy, to have the strategy. While we know that change is very important, but with, without strategy, I tell you what, the change is merely a substitution, not an evolution. Someone said that, you know, do change, but do it well, not, um, what did you say? Uh, you said that uh, reckless change can also be dangerous. That's true. Reckless change can be dangerous. And I agree. How can it be reckless? Would you agree that it can only be reckless when you don't actually give time to strategy at level of, you know, hence it's difficult for you to come up with strategy? Remember, without strategy, change is merely a substitution, not evolution. A lot of times in a family business, we are actually doing substitution. If this doesn't work, you replace it. You know, if, if this guy is not working for you, replace it. Or hire another one. Or wine. Or magbagulbol. But wait, what are you doing for that guy? For that COO or general manager? Have you somehow put strategies on how for him to be effective in working with you? Substitution is the act of using someone or something instead of another person or thing used. While... If evolution is a gradual process of change and development. And without strategy, one can change by replacing and or substituting a person or a thing or a process, but it's not growing, but never growing. So people in the workplace might end up being consumed and overwhelmed. Ladies and gentlemen, effectively sell change. And effectively selling change demands a strategy. 
from the global knowledge and local expertise that we in Premier have been fortunately been blessed working with local and international clients and consultants for over 10 years, I came up with five essential components of successful change that are very, very doable to family business leaders. I prayerfully hope that you can embrace these and that it will serve you as a foundation for your successful change management and change leadership. Let's go. First is awareness. You must be aware enough of family business landscape to recognize that a need for change exists. And this requires you to anticipate the unexpected and take proactive steps to provide solutions for a changing terrain like magnifying your vision as well from being traditionally you know linear to what i often call circular vision it's like coming up with an ecosystem of your business it's like you know connecting the value chain of your of your uh, business and you know coming up with a supply chain for example let me give you a quick example you know i, I was so passionate when i had my uh, advanced management program in ESA Business School uh, in Spain. And one of the cases that we actually work with is the case of Estee Lauder. Estee Lauder's case was, is actually a family business. He, he actually wrote um, in the case, actually uh, specified that Estee Lauder had circular vision. Uh, and, and that circular vision created a family dynasty in the cosmetic industry. So, Estee Lauder has created some sort of an ecosystem. And, you know, she anticipated the unexpected and took action to address the changing needs of women who were demanding to sample cosmetics products before buying them. So it's a, the, the lure is for them to test it first and, you know, uh, get the sample, plus, of course, the branding. As a result, she pioneered two marketing techniques then that are still very popular today. The free gift and the gift with purchase. Does that make sense to you? Awareness of your landscape. Awareness of who your customers are. Who are the customers that you are attracting or that are attracted or that are not attracted to your product as yet? For example, another, another very famous company is Apple a company that had originally been known for its computer products. And it's also ha had a keen, a keen sense of awareness in selling change. Remember Sony Walkman? Well, Apple made it virtually extinct, right? When they introduced the iPod. So Apple has so much of awareness of what's going on. Who do you think is the next iPod in your field or interests or industries? that has the awareness or the circular vision, that has the capability and capacity to connect the dots and come up with you know, a chain of clarity or clear understanding of what it would be look like to beat the competition. Do you think you know, um, this is something that will help you so that you can anticipate the unexpected? so that you will not become reckless in embracing change? Well, the second one is timing. Selling change requires impeccable timing. When I had my own experiences before, the change that I tried to introduce was, you know, doesn't, uh, I mean, not have the timing. This means having the ability, so timing means um, to have the ability to seamlessly sell change while minimizing disruptions. It requires you not to only be aware of when to make your pitch, but more importantly, how to sell change, knowing that regardless of what type of opportunity or innovative idea you are selling, it will create a counter effect of resistance. That's why timing is the single most important component to gaining initial buy-in to the change that you are selling. The right timing can build the required momentum to get your colleagues, senior management, and the boardroom, your family members, your founders, 
your brothers, your sisters, who are very essential in making decisions, for them to be excited about your idea. You must possess extreme patience you know, with the right amount of knowledge to determine your timing. Ladies and gentlemen, this is difficult. Do you agree? Because you are so passionate about selling change that you believe would benefit the organization that you serve. But along the way, you've seen the unforeseen. You experience the unforeseen. And so be equally, equally mindful that if your timing is wrong through, you know, the momentum you may have built in your career may instantly be lost. So take your path towards determining the right timing seriously. I know this firsthand, having launched several new ventures in my corporate and entrepreneurial career. For example, during one of my first ventures to professionalize and create a world-class community market in Cebu City, uh, my organization was one of the first to successfully provide such convenience um, and farm prices of fresh produce from eggs, vegetables, meat, seafood, and etc. We actually put in a lot of investments there, I mean, at least from my capacity then, and we implemented several collaborations and partnership strategy, which supposedly should create a scale of local producers, a higher scale of putting the local producers, you know, at no cost of rental, you know, in an air-conditioned facility in a community market stores. So I leased 3,600 square meters and I covered it with a, a very good um, you know, uh, roof and of course with an air condition. And during that time, this community concept that was way back 10 years ago was too early for the consumers to understand and change the way they buy their grocery items and produce on a regular basis. So what happened was that we became a weekend community store. And because we didn't have enough resources to sustain, we closed the business after a year of operation, after 12 months, and I lost um, an estimated to be more than 10 million capital. Timing. The third one is competency and know-how. Once you have become aware of the need to change and your timing was on point, your ability to sell change now requires you to showcase your competencies, your skills, your capabilities. Uh, to most effectively generate the outcomes you are projecting. Don't just sell an unattainable forecast. Sell an ability to sustain long-term bottom line impact that comes from the change you are selling. Don't you ever attempt to sell change if you can't deliver upon it. Remember that even if you are not successful in delivering the outcomes, the manner in which you are selling change is being critically evaluated. Regardless of the change you are selling, Manage the opportunity as if it were your last. Remember, your competency and know-how will be evaluated as if you were selling a new venture to a group of investors. So as such, you must be able to manage the outcomes you are selling by becoming politically savvy. Regardless of hierarchy of rank, you must be able to easily articulate in a manner that everyone can understand how you will be able to connect the dots of opportunity that you were previously and that previously were unseen or unrecognizable. So, in summary, please showcase strong competencies uh, or strong competency level by assembling or maybe by putting up a diverse team. Remember, when you hire people, don't hire people like you. Hire people who can complement you, right? So create or assemble a diverse team that can help you execute and that can help you sell the change all the way through to the end. For example, in my case, as a firm and a leader in a family business consulting space, all right, so this is now my current business, my organization has consistently seen that family business companies don't have the required patience, capability, and people they trust. Remember, People they trust to most effectively handle their family dynamics. Kanang mga away, away na sila. Kanang you know na anay mga misunderstanding, na anay mga luod luod. Sorry for the dialogue, but I think it's best communicated or articulated when it is in the same dialogue. And so, you know, family dynamics is kind of really difficult to manage, 
and family themselves may not have the competencies, the abilities, and they may not have the right people to trust to, to help them better improve their dynamics, especially in the context of succession. Remember, in a family business, there's always movement, whether you like it or not. There's always succession. And if we don't prepare for such eventuality or for such movement, and, maybe, and remember, movement is change, then it will be difficult for you to do the transition, especially in professionalizing the family and the business. So instead of pursuing this field you know, in, uh, as an individual consultant, serving the families in business and waiting for the time for me to you know bring the right people and hire the right people to be able to you know grow my family business firm you know especially when the momentum is there already i saw the opportunity to start building the firm rather than building myself i started building the firm and its core consultants composed of business consultants psychologists legal experts, organizational development experts, tax experts, you know, and the, and the like, as my core, you know, consultants to get into a formal education on family business systems with the help, of course, of FFI, a U.S. thought leader in global firm business consulting, who trained me and my team uh, and built competencies in us uh, that made us have this core uh, differentiations uh, in Premier. And through proper timing, focus, and competency, we created a holistic, multidisciplinary team of experts who has glow. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, that uh, the competency and know-how will be evaluated. Well, uh, is something that we all need to embrace. And I've given you already uh, my own examples of how I actually push my 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 own consulting firm in a level where you know the competency and know-how uh pushed led us to really pursue differentiations and sustainability uh even with the pandemic that is actually happening right now um so the second slide or the next slide is desire so this is the fourth uh you know uh desire having having the required tendency uh the required tenacity endurance um, and passion to sell change all the way through to the end is never easy and could be the ultimate breaking point to your successful change management and change leadership efforts. So selling change requires a level of desire that makes it mandatory for you to get your hands dirty throughout the selling cycle. This also means that you need to be ready to force you know, um, uncertainty head on or to face uncertainty head on and welcome the first, you know, the, the, the difficult bottles from the doubters who want you to fail. So desire is just being, you know, the, the willingness and the ability to tackle any tension points through the journey of selling change, but more so uh, an ability to accept the fact that you must continue to touch the process of selling the new opportunity as much as you lead it. Remember, touching the process requires you to stay involved. Even in menial tasks that you would rather delegate, this also requires having the desire to play the game like you are winning it, even when, you, when it feels like you are losing. So selling change is difficult and it takes a special level of desire in order to translate something that may be difficult for others uh, to see into something that is concrete uh, or enough for people to believe in and begin to hold onto. And when others observe your genuine, genuine um, desire to break through what seemed impossible, they will begin to support you as a sign of respect and gratitude. So. Desire will help you build momentum. The fifth one is mental toughness. Um, to, with, to withstand the obstacles and resistance by those affected by the change you are selling demands mental toughness. Do you agree? It demands mental toughness. And you know, mental toughness refers to the idea um, of being able to push past failures 
you know, by remaining positive and competitive. When the going gets tough, the tough gets going. We've all heard this at some point in our lives, correct? But aside from being a sport movie cliche, it also happens to get at the core of the rapidly growing field of business psychology where entrepreneurs and businessmen like you succeeded through mistakes and failures applied by thousands of hours of grueling effort exerted. Uh, and at the professional level, uh, there's financial and intellectual abilities uh, that were actually uh, not always what separates the professionals from the champions. In fact, many successful businesses right now are increasingly attributing their success to mental toughness. Example, you may have the will and desire to sell change, but you may not be mentally tough enough to finish each task at hand. And so mental toughness is imperative when selling change because you are almost always dealing with some form of crisis along the way. And, you know, mental uh, toughness allows you to separate um, issues and compartmentalize them in a strategic fashion uh, that strengthens your desire uh, rather than weakens your spirits. In other words, it allows you to become more mindful of how to best manage the consequences of the change that you are selling. Now, do you believe that adversity makes or breaks you? Can you share your, your answers? Do you believe that adversity makes or breaks you? It either can make you successful or it can really break you. This is very real. And at this time of crisis, you have seen many people and businesses falling apart. But on the other hand, you also see triumphant people and businesses despite the crisis, right? Uh, the crisis, this crisis, the adversity we are facing in the business primarily reveals you, primarily reveals us. And this is exactly what you experience when you sell change. It helps strengthen you and builds your character. So embrace change and it will make you a more credible, reliable, and enduring leader. Now my next question is very personal. Are you built to last? As a person, I have presented to you the strategies towards change um, such as awareness, competency, desire, uh, timing, and what's the other one? Mental toughness. But the question here is that, what about your attitude and the strategy towards change? Does it make sense to you? Do you think that your attitude and strategy towards change will help you determine your success or failure in pivoting towards change? True. If you believe on the need to have the right attitude and strategy to manage successfully the change necessary to succeed, well, I, the, king, the next question is, is your family built to last? Earlier, the early question was, are you built to last? And so we said that, okay, th there, this is the change process and these are the strategies, the awareness, uh, the competency, desire, timing, and mental toughness. Now that we are embracing it and we are now, you know, going forward, the next question here is, is your family built to last? Question? Well, the next question here is that, do you have the culture defined to keep the family bonded or resilient and be cohesive? knowing that family is composed of imperfect individuals? Do you have the right leadership tools to keep your family within an arm's length with your business? Or is it too heavily entrenched and very innato? Do you have a current estate plan, the one that includes strategies, not just in distributing the wealth to the next generations, but also stewarding the wealth? while minimizing tax exposures when death comes or when marriage is an unsuccessful to maybe one of your children? Do you have the right governance structure to help you manage objectively 
the noises, intricacies, and complexities of family business management. Do you have a strategic plan? Have you assessed your value, your, your, you know, your value chain or your supply chain? Do you have the right and invested people in the team? You know what, ladies and gentlemen, I have so much of questions, but these questions are designed to really trigger all of us. You know, if there's something that I'd like to share to you personally on what helped me to really, you know, uh, move fast and manage change fast, it's really on those questions that I have to keep on pounding, pounding myself so until I'll be able to come up with solutions and really hard embrace the hard truth. Now, another question. Do you still desire for your family business to last? You know, as an individual, we all know that, uh, you know, we always want to start. We always want to prove to other people that we can do it. We can build our own enterprise. But what about the enterprise that your parents have built for you? Which you may not necessarily have to act as a builder, but a grower. Can you take that role? Or do you still have the attitude of really proving yourself that you can build the same way your dad did? And so it will end up like you are competing each other or maybe not being able to focus on how to grow the core business because you're also busy proving yourself. Are you personally affected with the change that is happening right now in, in every family business? Let us now dive deeply in the business of perpetuating the family business in context of change and challenges, of which change and challenges continue to happen before our naked eye, regardless whether there is pandemic or not. Are you with me? Let's move now to the challenges of families in business. We are now set we are now set to really nourish ourselves individually, to be more aware of what's surrounding us and to really be able to embrace change and help others to be able to see the kind of change we want to make in every business or in, in, in the organizations that we lead to. But whether we like it or not, there are challenges going on in the family business that we need to be more aware of. For instance, the challenge of managing family unity. Are you familiar with this? There is sibling rivalry. There is competi competition of parents' resources. There is conflict with in-laws. And there is also that feeling that you are forced to work in the family business and maybe have some marital conflicts. What are you doing? What kind of expertise and skills do you have to be able to not just hide that under the rugs if you're experiencing that, but try to come up with mechanisms in a way where it, not, it does not only solve the problem today, but it also creates a culture that helps you to keep on solving that problem should it arise again. Are you with me? So that you be able, you'll be in a journey of sustaining and in embracing change. Because the truth of the matter is, all of us are not, cannot escape from any challenges and problems that may erupt within our family business. Next slide will tell you another kind of set of change. This kind of change um, is a challenge of leadership and business longevity. The question here is, why should you make these decisions? You know, if you are, a, if you are in the second generations and you're working with your brothers or sisters and you're doing the business together, sometimes you may feel that, why is it that he's the one making a decision? Should I be the one to make a decision because I'm older or, you know, I have more capabilities? Uh, another challenge is that this question, who said you should be the leader? Or you're immature and this is a wrong decision or maybe there is nepotism. Or between dad and the son, uh, the, the son or the children will feel like my dad won't let go and I don't want anything to do with this business. After all, my dad is the one running it, and, he, sh and he's, he, he is stubborn. So what happens to the family business? Next slide, please. The challenge, you know, the challenge of passing on the family business. Next slide, please. 
the challenge of passing on the family and the business assets. You know that, uh, uh, okay, before that, there's a challenge of professionalizing the family business. So, for example, when you say challenge of professionalizing the family business, um, you're looking at, uh, my slides is actually wrecked. So, you're looking at how to standardize our business processes. Uh, you're looking at how to make our people competent or how to organize our real financial statements or how to establish our fair compensation structure. How should we retain or hire professionals? Ladies and gentlemen, these are very, very important questions that whether you like it or not, uh, will really trigger a lot of challenges and change. Next slide, please. Uh, the next set of challenge is uh, the challenge of bal the challenge of balancing family welfare versus business growth there is this commingling of funds there is dividends versus uh, business capital you know invest in family needs or business needs so there's so much of challenges you know set of challenges in a family business next slide please and all of these challenges points to a level of not just understanding but adaptation uh, to be able to really see how can you solve those cha cha challenges and change for example this question what for you are the two strong causes of these challenges remember this is awareness what for you are the two strong cost causes of these challenges is it because of informality in um, you know uh, doing uh, the business or is it because of um, you know uh, the inability of the parents to actually guide you uh, well ladies and gentlemen we know that uh, the kind of uh, challenges that we have is also leading us to an opportunity that we need to embrace those chains next slide please Next slide, please. And uh, uh, next slide. Yes. And the business primarily exists to increase shareholders' wealth. Uh, but at the same time, the family also exists to be able to develop and support family members and to achieve strong bonds of emotional support. Right? And next slide, please. Uh, let's move it faster because, you know, we I don't have much time. Uh, and I think I'll be... Uh, uh, you know, uh, closing in about 10 minutes. Uh, so here is the situation. Founders often want their enterprise to continue after they die, but delay or resist in formulating a succession plan. Do you agree? Next slide. And when this happens, we know that there are opportunities that we need to do. And these are the four areas. Succession, transition, relation, and communication. And if you're going to go down to each of these levels, you will find a lot of opportunities for you to become a better version of yourself. Next slide, please. So the seven key principles of family business perpetuation is number one, family unity. Uh, second, uh, you, know, you know that family unity is actually the key and the very, very most important part. The second is policy before the need. It's important that when you are actually transitioning and you don't have the, you know, the policy before it is actually needed, it will actually create a lot of chaos and difficulties because you know, people will feel like uh, when there are problems and there is no policy, it becomes a personal problem for everyone to actually challenge, to, to solve it. Uh, whereas if there, when there are policies before it is needed, predictable issues will surface that may often cause that will actually provide more harmony. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the third, uh, next slide. So we go to the, th the third keys. Yes, next slide, Shaw. Uh, move pa. Establish governance structures. 
it's very important to really understand the whole structures of families in business. I'm sure you're already very familiar with all these structures, right? From the owner to business and family. Next slide. Let's go to number four, Show. Plan leadership successions. Uh, the leadership succession is essential because the leaders will have to really prepare the next generation of leaders so that you can pass on both the financial and emotional wealth of the family. Let's move to the fifth. All right. And um, after leadership succession, uh, you are looking at you know, ownership succession where you need to be able to come up with the right plan so that you be able to mitigate the risk of estate taxes. You know, there's a liquidity, it's, an, it's a liability. Uh, we can talk more on that maybe on the next session, sessions, but there are also possibility of freezing your other assets should death comes. Next slide, please. There is also one very important thing on my next slide that may trigger a lot of opportunities for you to really plan ahead. This one, a strange spouse may own your wealth Remember, when married children who own family assets enter separation or annulment of marriage, it also entails separation of assets. So it means that the estranged spouse may become part owner or director of your family business. Or the estranged spouse may, become, may cause havoc in the family dynamics. Okay, next slide. Uh, the key number six is about the, the need to come up with financial plans. Next slide, please. Uh, the family financial plan. Uh, it is important that the family members have to be guided on how they evolve in the change, especially transition and succession. And most of the change involves money. Personal need to become successful. So we need to be individually successful, but at the same time, we also need to be, to be successful as a family. That's why it's important to come up with a roadmap of the dreams, of what are your dreams and aspirations, and come up with the money equivalents of those dreams, of those aspirations. And then, finally, uh, move forward. Uh, the seventh and the last key is the family business strategic plan. We all know this is going to be my next slide, the last slides. We all know that the pandemic is giving us so much of problems, but also opportunities for us to embrace change. And one of the key and very interesting tools to uh, you know, embrace to is uh, for us to get into the stage of reflecting, getting insights and, you know, getting foresights and put the result in a process, with a process to be able to produce a family business strategic plan where you have the, the, on, the, on the left side, the family directions that you also have the, the, right, the, left, the right side, the business directions. Because what you don't want to happen is that you are so ambitious with your business and you have been so invest you have, you have invested so much of money in the business, but you lack manpower in your family. You lack strategies in keeping your family to really uh, push the business to the next level, right? Because ideas are good, you know, great ideas are really excellent, especially in this time of crisis, but you also need leaders who are family members to push those ideas. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is about family business perpetuations. While there is change, there is opportunity for us to become a better version of ourselves individually and also as an organization, a family business, so that we will have a better chance of perpetuating the family business to the next generation to create sustainable wealth. That being said, I'd like to say thank you for the patience and the trust and the confidence to actually bring us in. It is really my privilege, my, my opportunity to, you know, um, somehow trigger that level of, of um, you know, interest and desire for you to pivot uh, from where you are today to the next level of growth. With that, uh, I'm John Ramos. I'm, you know, an advocate of change. And I am now open to hear your questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramos or John. Uh, just, uh, I just like to read a comment, no, uh, from uh, Bonky Blood. Uh, very nice delivery of subject, very fitting, spoke from the heart. In behalf of the Auto Chamber, maraming salamat. Thank you very much. From Mr. Bert Akot, uh, reckless chains and not well thought of chains can make or unmake an organization. Perhaps uh, it's only a reaction from your end. No more question. Thank you very much.
I really appreciate your kind words. Um, I'm sure that you, you know, uh, you are very optimistic and um, are interested, are excited to, you know, get into the next level of change to help you have more uh, of your family business. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramos. And uh, should our members uh, would like to reach you, uh, we'll just get through with uh, with your contact details uh, with our Oro Chamber office. Maraming salamat. So at this point, sir, we would like to share this certificate of appreciation for you. Kagayan Oro Chamber of Commerce and Industry Foundation, uh, the certificate of appreciation uh, for your grateful appreciation for sharing your time, wisdom, and expertise as resource speaker for the managing change in pandemic-induced environment, perpetuating the family business. This during the third quarter general membership meeting and a board of trustee election. Given this 30th day of September 2021, signed by Mr. Ruben A. Bigafria, the president of the chamber, certificate of appreciation, Mr. Jonathan John Ramos. Maraming salamat, sir. Dagang salamat sa imong panahon. You're welcome, everyone. Godspeed. Thank you, Paul.